Well, Joel, thank you so much, first of all, for taking time and being with us. I know you've got a lot of demand uh, with what you do and where you are. Uh, Joel, you immigrated with your family to Israel, and you have seen rockets being shot into Israel over the last several years. But this is different, wouldn't you say? This is unlike anything I've ever seen before, Skip. I first came to Israel 35, 36 years ago to study at Tel Aviv University. And you're right, I've been coming back and forth ever since, starting the Joshua Fund, starting all Israel News. Uh, and of course, yeah, I've become a dual U.S.-Israeli citizen nine years ago. And when we arrived in August of 2014, we arrived in the midst of a rocket war. And about 4,000 rockets were fired in a month at Israel. And people thought we were crazy to come here, but God had called us. Almost as many rockets have been fired in the last four days as were fired in the entire month of August 2014. Okay, so that just gives you a sense of the scope. Look at that. This is the, and this is uh, Israel's uh, Pearl Harbor. This is our 9-11. It's the, it's the worst uh, set of civilian murders and casualties here in Israel in the entire history of the state of Israel in this short period of time. In fact, this is the biggest murder of Jews since the Holocaust, hmm. okay? Meaning meaning, uh, in, in, a, in a four day period, we've never seen anything quite like this. Uh, just one more point, 900 Israelis have been murdered so far. And, and I'm talking about like Hamas, look, most Americans don't know what Hamas is. They're a radical Islamist terrorist organization, but you have to think ISIS, okay? Hamas doesn't mean anything to most Americans. ISIS does. And what what has happened in the last four days here? Hamas has chopped off the heads of babies, okay? They've shot children in front of their mothers. They've shot and murdered mothers in front of their children. They've burned houses with Jews trapped in them to kill them. And like, it's just off the charts, demonic, satanic, and it's got everyone just in shock, grieving, of course, angry. But um, I think grief is the number one emotion that people are, are dealing with right now. And now we have to get ready to really go on offense. But uh, like rockets coming in, I, I, was, I was driving to the TBN studios here in Jerusalem yesterday, okay? And what happened? The sirens went off. And Lynn and I, my wife and I, and it happened to be that my oldest son, his wife, her brother had been visiting with us. We went to Cairo together. We toured them all over Israel. They were supposed to leave on Saturday. Oh, now there's a thousand rockets in the air. So all the flights were canceled. But anyway, they were all in the car with me. What happened? We, we have to get out of the car, stop the car, turn the engine off, run, and take cover as those sirens go off, meaning there's a salvo of missiles coming to Jerusalem. And then, boom, 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 boom. 14 or 15 times as the Iron Dome system intercepted the rockets, but one of them actually landed in a, in a mosque, uh, an Arab Muslim mosque. Uh, but my kids have not, you know, Caleb, yeah, our oldest, he's experienced this, but his wife hadn't, his bro her brother hadn't, so it's it's traumatizing. It's not normal. And yeah. it's hard to explain to people, and it's hard to watch them have to go through it. Let me zero in a little bit on what you just said. You said this is like Israel's 9-11 and Pearl Harbor kind of wrapped together. And I've been following some of your feed. You are the head of All Israel News, an excellent source, and All Arab News. And I just would recommend that to any of our listeners and, and those who are watching this, because you give uh, daily updates on all this and all things going on in the Middle East. But you mentioned 9-11 and Pearl Harbor. And so to help our listeners understand, if we were to compare the size of the United States to the size of Israel, it would be like it would be like 25,000 people instantly gone. I mean, it would be like 9-11 on steroids, right? Yeah, well, right, because the United States is 330 million people. Israel is 10 million. So you're 33 times larger. So um, you're thinking of a headline I did yesterday. Today we're over 900 murdered, or, you know, Israelis murdered. So, so now we're at about 30,000 Americans. In, in terms of, you just have to, I'm trying to 
to help people understand what would be the emotional impact in terms of the size of your population. So that's 10 times worse than 9-11, right? 3,000 Americans were murdered by Al Qaeda on 9-11, and we know how that changed America forever, right? And the emotional damage and the emotional toll. Um, now imagine it's 10 times worse. And for the, the population size that we are, that's what we're experiencing right now. Something on the magnitude of 10 times 9-11, and it's going to get worse from here. Your prime minister has declared formally a declaration of war. And so with that, what is the sense of the people there, uh, the, the population in general? Are any of them optimistic about this? Of course, grieving, scared. Are they resolved going forward? Oh, absolutely resolved. There's no question. We're going to win this war, but it's going to be messy. We're probably going to have to invade Gaza. Remember, this is an important point, Skip, to just bring up right up front. Israel does not occupy the Gaza Strip. Right. They were accused of it, but it's not true. In 2005, our prime minister at that time decided to pull all Israeli soldiers and all Israeli civilians out of the Gaza Strip and just give the Gaza Strip to the Palestinians as a gift. You can have it. We don't want it anymore. OK, so there's no there's no actual reason for a terrorist to come across the border and tell us, oh, you, you know, we're, we're here to you know fight you because you're occupying our land. We're not. Yeah, so people in the Gaza Strip, however, up to this point, have been allowed to go into Israel, haven't they, from the border at checkpoints? Very few. I mean, only from medical issues. Because because um, we withdrew in 2005, then they had democratic elections in 2006. But who took over? The Hamas terrorist organization. So ever since, Hamas has been firing, I don't know, we're up at 25,000 rockets, whatever it's been since 2006 okay so no then we had to put a blockade on gaza so the only people who could come in from gaza to israel would be people who need medical urgent medical attention or you know the joshua fund our ministry uh, has an annual conference to encourage and refresh uh, all of the palestinian pastors and their wives and ministry leaders and so some gazan Christians are able to get permits to come over to that conference, but it's very limited. West Bank Palestinians are able to apply for permits to come work in Israel, and tens of thousands of them do because they're good jobs and they can make quite a bit of more money than in the West Bank. But no, Gazans cannot because they're controlled by a terrorist regime. So uh, now let's kind of go into that. Um, he here they are. They're contained. Uh, the Gaza area is contained. Uh, but they're getting they're getting some kind of replenishment of the weapons that they use from somewhere. Talk about that. What country is behind this? Well, the main funder and supplier of arms and strategy and direction is Iran, the terrorist regime in uh, in Iran. Um, so that's a problem. One of the ways they the the, the, Iran, the the Iranians get their supplies of weapons in is by disaggregating them and you know hiding them in shipments of you know humanitarian relief goods or whatever or that they're dual use things like a lot of the missiles or rockets are actually built in metal shops in Gaza okay but they're they're not that sophisticated so you can just keep building you know thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them um, based on just scrap metal or, you know, st or, or metal that you're bringing in to reconstruct, you know, uh, damaged buildings and build new high rises. So a lot of international aid gets siphoned off by Hamas and used to build terror tunnels, weapons and so forth. But yes, and then whole weapons are smuggled in sometimes. We, we thought we were doing a good job at sealing it off, but clearly um, Iran and Hamas has... Uh, blindsided us by being far better prepared than Israeli intelligence realized. And that's a colossal failure, a staggering failure of Israeli intelligence. And there will be a political price to pay for those in power um, if they don't win this war so successfully that everybody focuses on, you know, on the victory rather than this horrific early set of defeats. Um, so uh, I think the... The, the political future of Prime Minister Netanyahu was very much in doubt. He was unpopular before the war began, but 
his sort of saving grace was he was always considered Mr. Security. And now that has blown a hole in the side of his brand, he was the one who made peace with four Arab Israeli countries, uh, four Arab countries, right? The Abraham Accords. He's Netanyahu is the one that has kept us out of major wars in the region and protected us. And he has done a good job, but something went wrong. Any guesses as to what went wrong or why? Is it Was it the diversion with the Supreme Court issue? Was it the... Uh, the focus on intelligence versus low-level attack like this? What was it? Well, from the Israeli side, we're gonna, there are going to literally be investigations to figure out how is this possible. Not just that we didn't understand that it was coming. Why was that border so lightly guarded? There were so few combat soldiers on the bases nearby or even or patrolling. It, it's astonishing to us. We, none of us can understand it. So we'll have to figure that out. In a general sense, Skip, I would say that the Israeli leadership may have been lulled into a false sense of security because of all the peace treaties and the focus on making peace with the Saudi kingdom, which seemed until now like it could be just weeks or months away. Now we'll, we'll have to see, right? But uh, it's possible that people just thought, hey, things are getting better. And in one way, they were getting better. But you can't let monsters out of the cage Otherwise, they're going to roam the countryside and kill. And, and that's what happened. They, you know, the Israeli leadership, the political, military and intelligence levels all failed uh, to stay focused on how dangerous Hamas really is and how ISIS like they really are. And um, it, 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 yeah, it's um, that's what. It's, it's not just grief. It's that sense of astonishment that, that we were so badly let down. Now, the question is, why did Hamas do it? Okay, now Hamas doesn't do anything on its own. It's all the direction comes from Iran, okay? So why does Iran want to pick a fight with us now? Because they want to blow up the, the peace process. They, they are terrified. The Iranian regime is terrified of the idea of an Israeli-Saudi peace treaty, because that would essentially be the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict as we've known it, right? And so what has been the Iranian strategy here? The Iranian leadership strategy is tell Hamas to go into Israel in this massive attack, then lure Israel into a ground war inside Gaza, which is going to be incredibly messy. It's urban warfare, street to street, house to house, apartment to apartment, booby trap, landmines, there are going to be high Israeli casualties and there's going to be high Palestinian casualties. And what does Iran want at the leadership level? What does the Supreme leader of Iran want? He doesn't, he, yes, of course he wants dead Jews, but what he really wants is dead Palestinians. Now you say, well, why would the Supreme leader of Iran want dead Palestinians? Because he wants television images of collateral damage of, of, of women or children and young men who are killed by uh, Israel as Israel tries to hit Hamas terrorists for hiding behind the human shields of the two million Palestinian civilians and behind our Israeli hostages that they have, right? So that's, that's this cowardly, demonic way. So as we try to go get them, no matter how hard we try, and we will try very, very hard not to kill civilians, but it will happen. And when it happens, this will make the supreme leader of Iran very, very happy because CNN, MSNBC, all the networks, New York Times, BBC, Al Jazeera, everybody else will start to make us as Israelis look like monsters. That, that we're not defending ourselves from monsters, but now we are the monsters. And that they, they, the Iranian leadership hopes will cause the Arab Muslim world to back away from Israel rather than gravitate towards us and that should, I mean obviously ultimately Iran wants us to be annihilated it's the Iranian leaders that are on the record that keep saying we want to wipe Israel off the map so of course they want to kill us all but to get there they need to isolate us and what they're terrified of us is rather than the whole Muslim world being against us right now more and more of the Muslim world is for Israel and that's what they're trying to blow up right now. Joel it's been said that Israel will use bombs to protect its people, while Hamas will use people to protect its bombs. Their strategy is different. So yeah. now that an incursion has happened into Gaza, 
there's rubble from the bombings, and there's going to be, it seems like, from what you just said, a house-to-house, door-to-door. Is the thought that it's just going to be a slight incursion, or is it going to be a total takeover of Gaza? There hasn't been an Israeli ground operation inside Gaza, I, I, I don't think, since 2014. I think it was called Operation Protective Edge. And then Israel just decided, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth any of our soldiers getting killed. Why don't we just keep building out the Iron Dome system? Because for at that point, it was, quote, just rockets coming at us. And if we can shoot 95% of them down, then that keeps us from having to go invade Gaza. But this has changed the calculus. The, 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 the magnitude of Israelis that have been killed, and there's, it's just, and the way we, they've been killed, babies' heads chopped off and so forth, it's, it, it, it has created total unity. You mentioned earlier, um, why now did the Hamas go? Yeah, they they saw Israelis very divided because of our you know internal debates over judicial reform, Supreme Court reform, and so forth. So they thought we were weakened. But Hamas has just done in four days what nobody else could do in the last uh, year, which is unify Israel. Israel's a hundred percent unified, and in fact. Netanyahu last night on television called for the leaders of the opposition parties to join him in an emergency unity government. Those negotiations are ongoing. I think that will probably happen. I think it should happen. And so then we'll be at war. But I think we're going into the biggest invasion of Gaza ever because I think that the unified position is enough. We can never let this happen again. And the only way is to go into Gaza so hard and so deep as to completely eradicate Hamas forever. That will be hard. That will be bloody. But there's a prophetic angle to this, Skip. It's possible that if this happens and Israel truly wins and completely eliminates Hamas, suddenly Gaza would be peaceful. And this would add to the sense of Israel's becoming more and more peaceful with more and more of its neighbors. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but it's possible that this could be setting up a moment where the Palestinians would realize they're defeated. Don't try to destroy Israel. Learn to live at peace next to Israel. And that could lead to the very conditions of Ezekiel 38, peace and prosperity in Israel, when then... Russia, Iran, and these other countries come to attack in Gog and Magog. Too early to draw any conclusions. There's a lot of messiness ahead of us. But I'm just saying, if you look down the road a bit, um, as bad as this is, it gives Israel 100% unity. Finish this terror movement off. No more. You can't let this keep happening forever. Is there a scenario where Israel could completely take over the Gaza strip and it become now a part of Israel and just eliminate Gaza as a Palestinian territory? I don't think so. Um, I, I technically, Gaza is part of Judah. If you go back to the scriptures, uh, you can see that. But um, the conclusion was made by then Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon in 2005 that it's not something we Israel wants. Now, in the Millennial Kingdom, yes, it will be part of Israel. But at the moment, there is total unanimity that nobody here in Israel wants to control the lives of the Palestinians. Uh, And I would say, uh, to use an American country Western song, it's sort of like, I don't want her, you can have her, she's too fat for me. Meaning, like, we just, it's just too much of a headache to, to be in charge. So, what I think would happen is Israel would apparently have to invade. It would be very bloody, very bad. Um, it, it could well, it could be very long. And I think the world would much, very much turn against us, uh, and that would be a problem. But if if it was successful, the way Israel, uh, the United States went into Afghanistan or into Iraq, you know, messy and long, hopefully not that long. But if you could actually win decisively, then the question would be, how could you help set up a moderate... Palestinian leadership that would be like, look, look, we are ready to live at peace with Israel and we want international aid to look, to build a, a Palestinian paradise. I mean, Skip, let's, I want all of your listeners and your congregation to realize 
when Israel pulled out in 2005, it, the Palestinians had every opportunity to make a Palestinian paradise in Gaza. It's on the Mediterranean, which is gorgeous. They have natural gas right off their shores. They, they could have huge tourism. They could build beautiful hotels and resorts. They have so much money if they started drilling for this natural gas. They could export it to Europe. They could export it to Jordan and Egypt. It, it, it could be a paradise. I wrote about it in my first political thriller, The Last Jihad, 20, uh, whatever it was, 23 years ago. Uh, and uh, it could be amazing. And maybe that's where we're heading. But it, it can't be led by a, a ISIS regime. And so, unfortunately, uh, it's going to fall on Israel because nobody else is going to do it to go uh, clean out this hornet's nest. And um, I, I have many of my friends who are under 40, these young men, they have been called up and they are getting ready to go into the biggest war, I think, in the history of Israel. Yeah. Joel, since, the, since the founding of the country. It's hard to watch the images, the videos that are coming um, out on all sorts of feeds. It seems to me, though, that we must see them. We need to see what evil looks like. This is pure evil. And as distressing as it is to watch them, don't you think it's necessary that we in the West get a glimpse of this? Well, yes, w within reason. I mean, I, I, I do caution people. Uh, some of it is just beyond the pale. But, um, you know, I'm preparing my weekly primetime TV show on TBN, The Rosenberg Report, uh, and we will we'll show, uh, we're not going to show the carnage because it's just too gruesome, but we will show uh, interviews and clips of, uh, well, I've got several key interviews, uh, a key a senior advisor to Netanyahu, the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. I've already done those interviews, but we're gonna, I'm going to show clips of grieving mothers and children. And so you, you can see the emotion of the trauma that has been inflicted. And we'll show some of the, some of the fighting, but not, you know, it's, I just, I don't want to glorify it. And I don't want to sicken people. Like I, there, there's some balance between helping people understand the horror without taking people to a horror show with images. They'll never be able to get out of their head. I don't, I don't know. We got to. I got to find that balance this week. So quickly, just tell us about the Rosenberg report because uh, it's a very unique feature on TBN. Also, all Israel news, all Arab news. Tell us about how people can get plugged in and hooked up. Well, I, and I'm grateful to you, Skip. Uh, not only did you help us start the Joshua Fund, which is our ministry that Lynn and I started 17 years ago to provide humanitarian aid, relief, and strengthen the church here in Israel and the Palestinian territories and the neighborhood. Uh, we've raised and invested almost $100 million over this period to, to care for people in the name of Jesus. So that's the Joshua Fund. You helped us get that started. Now, three years ago, you helped us get started all Israel news and all Arab news. And you sit on our board, and I'm very, very grateful because we realized that if you're trying to educate the church as well as other people about what's really happening, the question is, what news sources do you trust? And uh, we've got a situation in which like a lot of the news media are calling Hamas militants, not terrorists, right? They're, they're, they're saying, hey, we need to de-escalate. We need to we need a ceasefire. Uh, imagine if in Albuquerque, some lunatic with an AR-15 goes in and takes over school and elementary schools are just shooting children. When the SWAT team arrives, does the mayor say, hey, we need to de-escalate? We, we need a ceasefire. No, you want the SWAT team to go in and arrest or kill the shooter to protect people. That's, that's the situation. So already the media is turning. There's a few days of sympathy, and now I expect uh, in the days ahead, things are going to get very much turned against Israel to make us look like monsters. So with that level of bias that's just endemic to the media, we decided that we needed to launch an actual credible news source run by Israeli followers of Jesus for mostly for the evangelical world who loves Israel, but obviously Muslims and Jews watch it and read it too. Um, it's not a missionary site. It's, 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 it's real news. We, you know, we sit down with Netanyahu, Netanyahu. We, we sit down with generals. We sit down with Arab leaders. I, I, you know, we provide daily coverage hour by hour of all that's happening. And you can find that at allisrael.com. 
allisrael.com, and then it's cross-linked to All Arab News. And you can also sign up for the free email newsletter at allisrael.com. So every morning when you wake up, you'll get the, all the top headlines with hyperlinks so you can see what's happening. And if you want to go deeper into one of those stories, you just click on it. Then you don't even have to think about it. You just know every day news from Israel and the region that's, that you can trust uh, from a biblical worldview is coming to you. That's what we did. And we're seeing our traffic surge, especially now as people are realizing, wow, there is a source that I can trust. And it's not CNN or MSNBC or BBC or whatever. What happened last year, about a year and a half ago, was the president of TBN, the Trinity Broadcasting Network, um, the largest Christian television network in America, was he was watching what we were doing at All Israel News. And he thought, wow, that should be a TV show. Uh, and Joel and his team really know what they're doing. We should just turn that into a show. There, there isn't another primetime news and analysis show produced here in Israel on any American television network, secular or Christian or whatever. So they asked me to do it. Now, I, I told the president of TBN, uh, Matt, uh, I got a face for radio, my friend. I don't know. I, you know, I question your judgment. Why do you want to put me on television? But and I also don't have the time. But after a lot of prayer and your counsel and others, uh, we decided to do it. And we just finished our first year. We just started our second year, uh, signed a new contract. And we're now I can do visually what we're doing digitally on the all Israel news platform for and, and in 22 and a half minutes we'll give you we'll give you what's happening the biggest stories in israel but also like who are the believers here what's happening and from a biblical worldview what's happening prophetically um you know it's not just uh it's not just war and terror although right now it is but it's it's uh i hope it's something you can find helpful and you can find that at rosenberg report Dot TV, RosenbergReport.tv, and that's where you can find all past episodes. And if you sign up for our free email newsletter there, every Thursday, you'll get the email a few hours before the show goes on. You'll know a little bit of what's going on that night and a link to last week's show in case you missed it. And then you'll never have to think about it again. And we're amazed how many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are watching this show. And we're very encouraged, especially at a time like this. Joel, I know you would say you're not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I'm going to ask you to prognosticate just a little bit. No, I'm, I'm running nonprofit, Skip. Oh, that's good. We have a tour slated for, and I'm going to get this question, so I'm asking you. We have a tour to Israel slated for May of 2024. You have one coming up as well. So I, I've spoken to people who have flown this week into Israel, thinking that they're going to be able to go on a tour in the next— Right, Gino Geraci was here. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And and I was talking to Joel James. He was, has several hundred people coming in over the next couple months. What's your sense of this happening for people? Well, we haven't canceled the Joshua Fund tour for November. Obviously, I, I, uh, I'm not encouraging people to come right this moment. In fact, uh, my own son, daughter-in-law, and her brother were here, uh, and they were supposed to leave on Saturday, and then you know all the flights were canceled. And so they just got on a flight, you know, this afternoon after three other flights getting canceled uh, day by day. So, no, it, right now, foreigners are, are, are getting out of the country, and, and rightly so. In fact, my son and daughter-in-law and his brother, her brother, they were literally sitting on the tarmac getting ready to fly out, and they could hear the booms of the Iron Dome intercepting rockets. And so the plane just waited until things got quiet again. And then there seemed to be a window, and man, they, they punched it and got out. So, praise God. So, so, but but I wouldn't I wouldn't project all the way to December or to next May, and 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 think that we're going to still be in this crisis. Uh, wars in Israel, even when we say they're long, they're not as long as you know the United States going to war in Afghanistan for twenty years. Like we don't do that here. So, we'll know in the next month or so where we are. I would encourage people to. Keep you know, keep planning, leaning forward. If obviously with the Joshua Fund or with you, Skip, you know, I, we're not going to take people into harm's way. There's no calling for that. Our calling to be here, but you know, somebody coming on a tour doesn't have that calling. So we won't take people. You won't take people if they're in harm's way. Um, but that's so far off 
that I would say still sign up. And, uh, obviously, you'll get your money back if if the tour has to be postponed. But it is amazing. Um, and, uh, and it's very tragic that right now we can't show people the country we love. Yeah. To put a fine point on that, it seems that Christians should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We're told to do that in Psalm 122. But also standing with Israel and supporting them by giving them our tourist dollars. We want to see the land of the Bible, but it also helps Israel. It does. It does. And, you know, my motto for the Joshua Fund is to learn, pray, give, and go. So part of our mission is an educational mission, right? And, and that's what we do through All Israel News and through the Joshua Fund's podcast called Inside the Epicenter, which I commend to you all. Uh, and in other ways with our conferences and tours, the more Christians learn about God's heart for Israel and her neighbors and the biblical past, the current ministry that God is doing right here through the believers in the land and the geopolitics and what the prophecies hold, the more you learn, the more you'll understand how to pray effectively and consistently. And the more you invest your heart in praying for Israel and her neighbors, for peace, but also for salvation, the more you'll have a sense of, I want to make a difference. I want to make a financial contribution. And you can do that to a ministry like the Joshua Fund. Right now, we just got off of a prayer call and, and a strategy call for how can we, the Joshua Fund, which is uniquely positioned, we know all the believers in the land, all the ministries. We we do humanitarian relief, and we're ready uh, to help. But right now, we need to raise about five hundred thousand dollars for the next wave of, of big challenges that are coming in the, in the next few days and weeks. So that's a, a practical way to get involved: learn, pray, give, but then go. There will be a point where the country will be open again, and I say go, or in my case, I would say come, right? Because now I live here, but. There's nothing like, there's no better way to stand with Israel than to stand in Israel, to pray, to worship, to let Skip take you and teach you the scriptures. And like just taking my, my own, you know, my oldest son obviously lived here with us until he went home to America to get married. But his wife had never been here. Her brother had never been here. It was so fun. It's always so much fun for us. And I know for you and Lenya to introduce people to the land of the Bible and see the scriptures come alive when they've never been here before, but it's been a lifelong dream. That is such an exciting thing. And then helping them understand, look, this is not just about ancient history. This is about prophecy, but it's also about right now. How do we reach every Jew and Gentile in the land of Israel and the neighborhood with the gospel of Jesus Christ? How do we make sure everyone has at least heard the gospel? How can they call on the one they've never heard of, right? So. And how do we equip and strengthen the local believers? Um, this is the things that Lynn and I love the most. And it all starts with educating the church. That's why I'm doing I don't know, two dozen interviews in the last uh, couple of days. And then, of course, I would do one with you, Skip. And I've got another one after this and more tomorrow because that's my role, right? I'm not a doctor. Otherwise, I'd be out there healing people, right? And, and I'm not, you know, there's a lot of things I don't know how to do. <laughs> but explaining Israel and God's heart for Israel and her neighbors is, is my greatest passion aside from loving Jesus myself and loving my wife and family. So this is what we do. And um, we'd love people to get involved in helping the Joshua Fund and all Israel news, especially at, at a critical moment like this. Joel, I know you got a lot of these lined up. Thank you for taking the time. I expect to see you in May. We always right. love you when you can come and speak to the group and give us a briefing and that would be a timely briefing indeed. So God willing, I'll see you in May. I would love that. Thank you so much, Skip. And thank you to everybody who, who listens um, to your podcast, your radio show, and of course, in your congregation. May God bless you guys for, for loving Israel and her neighbors so much and, and, and caring about these issues. Thank you. Thank you. God bless.